What do you look for when you're out somewhere and you're like looking at gems and specimens? The first thing you do is you look for something that catches your eye. Okay. By being the experienced collector, mm -hmm. which I guess I am, I've seen a lot of stuff. So after that, it, it's like, is this in a price point that I think I can live with? What's going on guys? Today we're doing a video uh, with Sarah. Thank you for coming today. We're going to be taking a look at some highlights from a few of our friends' collections of okay. minerals and gems and stuff. And we're gonna have a beginner collection, a kind of intermediate collection, and then a longer running, more expert collection. Okay. I am the beginner collection. I've only been kind of collecting on and off. When I see something I like, I'll grab it if the price is okay. right, you know? Sort of a budget collection with a few found specimens, oh. like in the backyard. Yeah, yeah. You ready to get started? Yeah, I'm ready. So this is heavy. It's a, it's a little, I'll explain. Okay. <laughs> oh, I bet this one's the heavy one. Yeah, so you can just this set is cool. that on the Like. Oh, I'm, glad, I'm glad you like that. That's a sphere of ruby, which is the red part, and zoocyte, which is the other part. Did they naturally form together, or did somebody mm -hmm. take them and go? So they naturally formed together, but then someone took it and carved it and polished it into a sphere. It looks like mint chocolate chip. It, it does. <laughs> and the other one's strawberry, maybe. I don't know, it's a little dark to be strawberry. It's like grape. black cherry. Black cherry. I don't think I would <laughs> eat grape flavored ice cream. <laughs> okay, and then go ahead and pull the other guys yeah. out. Cool. So it's not the prettiest thing in the world. So they're all the same mineral. They're all calcite. And calcite is mm -hmm. overall kind of an unremarkable mineral. It's found all over the world. But what's very cool about it is it can come in a lot of different colors and different crystal hats. So these are all kind of the same general shape. Mm -hmm. This is what's known as a dog tooth calcite. Okay. Does... Some people call it a chicken nugget or a chicken tender. <laughs> That's not true, only one person. Well, I'm vegan, so I don't think that. Okay, well, you don't have to eat them. Mm. <laughs> no, don't resist. <laughs> this one's kind of large. This one's a sort of double little pyramid guy. And then this one, you can see the crystals are mm -hmm. twinning. Twinning, it's basically where two crystals sort of form and share in their crystalline structure. They're conjoined crystals. You can see this general shape here and here, right? Mm. Except they're sort of forming like this into each yeah. other. And then on the back side, you have two smaller ones that are forming like this. So they're twin, but they're like growing away from each other. Yeah. Calcite has a hardness of like three. Oh. So it's very soft, which is why it's all dinged up and nicked and scratched and bludgeoned. These my dad found doing yard work in his backyard. No. Yes. And then this I bought for a steal. I actually got this for $5. Yes. This is cool. The ruby half of that sphere fluoresces. Cool. It's very cool. <gasps> so it doesn't like change color, but it becomes like a neon version of itself. You know what I yeah. mean? So yeah. why does it fluoresce? Fluorescence is a little bit technical, but basically the ultraviolet light excites the electrons in the ruby and they jump orbitals, basically, which causes fluorescence. Also necessary for the fluorescence is the presence of chromium in ruby's uh, chemical structure because chromium mm -hmm. is what causes it to fluoresce. But wait, there's more. I have one more thing to show you. A young viewer, his name is Nija. We gave him a tour around the campus. We showed him the crystals in the courtyard and stuff. Oh yeah, those are massive. Um, when he showed up, he gave myself and Brittany each a box oh, like that's this. that's so cool. And he wrote a clue on the cover like it was an unboxing. And we actually, we sat him at this table and like did a fake unboxing, you know, with the with the stuff. Fun. So we're gonna get a lot of mileage out of this. <laughs> now you're gonna unbox it. Okay, so we're often replaced by quartz carnelian or others found in our backyard in Indiana. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Go ahead and open the box. Did that, was that a good clue for you? It, Did you? Um, well, replaced is a key word. So sometimes a mineral can over time replace the existing either mineral or in the case of a fossil, the organic material that is there. This is just a so slab cool. covered in fossilized shells. So from an ancient sea floor, where now <laughs> Indiana exists. Yeah, I don't think of Indiana as being like oceanous. Well, it ain't. <laughs> Not anymore, it hasn't been for a long time. This came from their backyard, it's quite heavy. Fossilization is organic matter that dies, settles, and before it can fully decompose, like a shell, which takes a long time, some other mineral 
for example, quartz comes in and replaces it. So it has the same shape, mm -hmm. but it's not a clamshell anymore. It is carnelian or agate or quartz. This was just a very touching gift with a nice story to it. And so I wanted to share that because yeah. it's probably the most the testament to the kind of impact that we have yeah. with this channel on on you know young people. But we've got Preston on deck who's gonna show you some of his stuff. All right. So they're telling me I'm the mid-tier collector, which how insulting, <laughs> but no, I'm kidding. Intermediate, that's a better word. I get it. Believe it or not, I've only been in the gym world for like two and a half years. Before this, I came from like being an animator. But <laughs> let me just give you the box. <laughs> cool. Ooh, so this one's like purpley, red. That's a great descriptor. <laughs> that is actually how you define colors in gemology, <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, this requires kind of light. So. Okay, so I know it's definitely a star something. Mm -hmm. That's the question, the something. Yeah. There are things that are chatoyant, there are things that have asterism, they all have the same building blocks, which is uh, plentiful parallel lines of microscopic rutile. Uh, when light enters the stone, it internally reflects through the crystals of rutile, and in this case, with a six-rayed star, it's three different directions of rutiles. This stone I bought at auction. This was listed as a Burmese star sapphire. Gem collectors all around the world love Burmese material. Corundum, it's a nine on the most scale of hardness. This is six and a half carats. But through all of my tests, I don't see any issue with calling this a uh, ruby. It has chromium in it. It okay. is... Oh, wow. There we go, okay. <gasps> No. So it contains tons of chromium, so it fluoresces a bright red. That's crazy. Sapphire and ruby, they're technically the same. Just different colors. It's the right. Color so that... it's a coloring element in there. Mm -hmm. So it depends. Um, it's really one of those questions: Are you buying or are you selling? Right. Um, Ruby's known to have a lot of chromium in it, causes that mm -hmm. fluorescence. While sapphire is typically well, it depends on the color but whenever we see a spectrum for a blue sapphire, we see an iron spectrum. And if you have too much iron in your corundum, that quenches fluorescence. I'm gonna look at these next, because these are... So these might what... require some tweezers. Okay. So it's definitely shiny. Okay, that's, that's good. And I'll uh, say why in a minute. <laughs> it's like there's stuff in it that makes it look like kind of like a comic book, cloudy, stormy sky. Good take. So when I move it around, mm -hmm. the way it's shining does kind of remind me of a diamond. Correct. They, they are diamonds. <laughs> These are salt and pepper diamonds. You hit it on the head with the, the shiny. Diamonds in general have an adamantine luster. It's the highest classification of luster. It literally means diamond-like. Diamond is a 10 on the most scale of hardness. It's actually four <laughs> times harder than corundum, which is a nine on the most scale of hardness. And because it has such a high hardness, it can take such a pristine polish. Diamonds have varying fluorescences. <gasps> based on whatever element snuck in there during the <laughs> formation process. So right here, I, it's like a blue fluorescence. It's kind of like an ethereal kind of fluorescence. Mm -hmm. I'm doubling down on my comic book. Comic book? It is very comic booky. Yeah, right there. <laughs> they're diamonds in every single way, except they're heavily included with carbon inclusions. Okay. So, and they all look a little bit different. That one almost looks like it's got a black tinge to it. I like salt and pepper diamonds because they're all a little bit different. They're very yeah. unique. These don't have clarity, really. They're transparent material, but they're not transparent enough to be really graded as a diamond, so they won't really have a diamond grading. I still love them. Yeah. <laughs> we got one more. This one's a treat. This one's probably my favorite. It's like cross hashes, mm -hmm. and they look geometric. You know, when, when they say uh, Mother Nature doesn't draw in straight lines. She did here. Yeah, she did. Of. So this is Rainbow Lattice Sunstone. 
which actually isn't a variety of sunstone at all. It's a moonstone, still feldspar. And what the lattice is, it's a, it's a very thin layer of magnetite. This magnetite gets in the moonstone and it forms in this geometrical lattice and it has this iridescence on the surface of it. So you yeah. see these flashes of color in there. We did a video with Darren Arthur a couple years ago when we were at the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show and he was kind enough to bring us some pieces for our own personal collection. Wow. He discovered Rainbow Lattice Sunstone, really great guy in Australia. So, got that piece from the from the source. So I brought my buddy Tom along and he's got some really nice. cool stuff to show you. So let's get him in here. Hi, I'm Tom. From what they told me when I walked in, I'm the experienced buyer. So, here we go. Oh, these all look so different. Yes, ooh. I think this one looks so interesting to me on first glance. Yeah, did you notice how heavy it was? Yeah, it's heavier it than it looks. <laughs> yes, so this is a lead-based mineral. So yeah. the green is pyromorphite. Okay. And then it's a pseudomorph with the blue, which is plumogummite. That's just, a fun word. <laughs> the plumogummite? Yeah. It is my favorite. This was on my bucket list for two or three years. Yeah. And I went to Tucson and just really started looking around. I found the right piece. It was right in my price range. <laughs> And I love it. It has a nice little opening here in the back Yeah. that almost looks like a cave. That's something that I really look for in all the minerals that I get is that they have different textures to them and constantly changing. But a pseudomorph is basically where one mineral replaces the mm -hmm. other but keeps that same crystal shape. And these really probably came out on the market probably three or four years ago and they really became popular. Yeah, I like how it's quite seamless the way it transitions from you know, top to bottom, yep. but they definitely have different textures. Yeah, absolutely. This is a lot more spiky when you mm -hmm. really look at it and it's got like a kind of a waxy luster to it. And this is almost like a matte finish. Yeah. But the color combination is just striking. And a lot of times, because pyromorphite comes in different habits, you'll see some that are botroidal, and those are the ones. I really want one of those, but that'll be a couple years down the road when I save some money. Yeah, okay. You know. What else do we have? So this is Elmwood fluorite. I got a whole flat of Elmwood fluorites. All of them looked a little bit different, and this one really just stood out to me because it looks like candy. It does. Uh, with <laughs> that sugar dusting on top. And it's really, you know, perfect cube. It's sitting on a piece of sphalerite, which if you're an Elmwood collector, which Elmwood is a really famous mine, mm -hmm. uh, none of it was being mined specifically for fluorite. Okay. But all of the geologists who were working there started noticing these are perfect cube. So they started tucking them all away. This is really where the term lunchbox specimens came from. Okay. Because they were sneaking them out in their lunchbox. <laughs> so whatever's whatever with that, I'm just glad that these weren't dynamite blasted. That corner has like a perfect edge to it. When it goes clear or colorless, that is what they call a Carthage corner. And okay. that is really indicative that you have a very nice fluorite specimen. But yeah. this one is just something that I pick it up and look at it all the time. If you're a real collector that loves what you have, you always pick it up. So we have one more. Yeah. Which, I mean, all of these are amazing. But this one, like yeah. there's stuff inside. Yeah, so this is Copal. Which okay. Copal is, it's not amber, it's not old enough to be amber. So mm -hmm. it'll sometimes be referred to as baby amber. So it's the same thing, it's a hardened tree resin. Mm -hmm. It just hasn't had enough time to be called amber. Just like with amber, copal tends to have a lot of insect inclusions. It could be from termites to just little crawling bugs. I bought a big bag of this. My wife and I are sorting through them bugs, no <laughs> bugs, because no bugs still have value, but bugs are what everybody wants. <laughs> so I tossed this one to the side, and my wife's like, do you want to keep this? It's not a bug, but... And as I looked at it, and you can see on the end, it yeah. almost looks like blood inside it. Does. it. There's a few spots of it. And then, as I looked at it even closer, it has a floating bubble inside of it. So it? quartz, a lot of times, they call them anhydros, mm -hmm. and it's where it's filled with water, and you can rotate it and see the bubble move. Oh. A lot of people look at organics as kind of morbid. It's honestly waste material. A mm -hmm. pearl is waste material and a protectant for the mollusk. Amber is the same way, copal is the same way. It, it slowly traps and freezes in time. Mm -hmm something that could not get out of the way. So okay. morbid, yes, but 
it, it's frozen in time forever. What do you look for when you're out somewhere and you're like looking at gems and specimens? Well, I mean, I think that it's the same way you pulled them out of the box. Mm -hmm. The first thing you do is you look for something that catches your eye. Okay. By being the experienced collector, mm -hmm. which I guess I am, I've seen a lot of stuff. So I can find beauty in every rock that I come mm -hmm. across. The first thing is just that it has to catch your eye. After that, it, it's like, is this in a price point that I think I can live with? But when it comes to fluorite, I buy every single one that I come across. Okay. I can't not. But I did actually bring something for you. I want to help you start off your collection. Oh my goodness. So, calcite on dolomite. And oh, it's wow. an American mineral. So it comes nice. from Indiana. Indiana. Quarried in Indiana. Yep. Wow. Well, thank you. That's awesome. You're welcome. That's so sweet. Yeah. Thank you. And I can't wait to maybe come back in a year and we'll show off your collection. Yeah. So Tom has brought us some amazing pieces, but we're going to take a closer look at everything we've seen today. I know what my favorite one was, but what was your favorite mineral you saw today? Comment down below, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that bell so you can see future videos from us. And I might even be in some of them. Bye.